Right, let's have a look at data and the Internet of Things. This is big data and the analytics that go with it. This is a huge area that we're only going to just touch on. Uh, in fact, we at Curtin have two courses, an undergraduate degree in uh, data science and another postgraduate degree in data analytics and predictive analysis. So let's have a quick look. So what we're going to have a look at is the value of data, uh, what actually makes up big data, how we analyse it or begin to look at how we analyse it. We explain how data is used to create knowledge. This is a, a key issue. Data is of no use unless we can actually do something with it. Uh, and we'll have a look at the acquisition preparation and another quick look at the ethics. OK, the value of data. The amount of data to be stored and analysed is expanding, and it's expanding dramatically. We saw this earlier on with the increase in the, not only the number of nodes, but the quantity of data that each of these nodes and IoT moats is collecting. Um, the variety of data is uh, also changing, what we're looking at, what we're collecting, and it's going to impact the three elements of our lives, business, social and environment. Now, there's a simple little example here, horticultural example. Um, we're dealing with uh, an agricultural uh, scenario. In here we can have temperature sensors to look at whether it's a hot day or a cool day. Uh, we look at sunlight to see if it's cloudy or humid. Uh, and we have moisture settings so we can tell if we need to actually turn the sprinklers on or not. We can take this a lot further. In fact, we've got a small project running at Curtin for subsistence farmers and we're doing soil measurements looking at pH, salinity, nitrogen levels, moisture, temperature, humidity and several other factors linking this into GPS and then mapping it so that the farmers can look at uh, changing conditions of their soil, such as creeping salinity or uh, changes in the pH level. So, what is data? Data can be many things. Words in a book, article, web page, whatever. Contents of a spreadsheet or database. Pictures create a great deal of data and contain a great deal of data. Um, data can be useful information, or quite often is useful, but not always. Sometimes we collect data that is actually not necessary for the application we're looking at. Most data can't be used as is. We need to perform some filtering or analysis on that data to turn it into something that will be of use to us. And data analysis provides us useful information and trends on what's happening. So let's have a look at the growth of data. Data is growing exponential. We basically have a graph here from Cisco's Visual Networking Index that shows uh, that rate of growth. Um, it's massive amounts of data, 26 exabytes per month by 2020 in mobile data, 195 exabytes per month in 2020 across IP networks, which is your standard sort of network. So this is a huge amount of data and it's increasing all the time and it's only going to continue to increase with the advent of more sensors and more devices being connected to the internet. So where does this data come from? Right. Well, it comes from a lot of places. Now, I'll give a couple of examples here. If we look at an inertial measurement unit on a person walking, right? we use this in medical type uh, scenarios, looking for gait anomalies, seeing if somebody's uh, knee surgery has been successful or unsuccessful, uh, that sort of thing. And these are fairly short trials, but they will give an example of how much data is involved. So when we put these IMUs on a person, we collect around about 4.8 kilobits per second, or 288 kilobits per minute uh, from the six sensors on a 10 minute trial. So we get 720 kilobytes per trial per patient. Now that adds up to a lot of data. How much of this is useful? Well, it depends what we're looking for. Another example is the Sydney Harbour Bridge. That has had 3,200 sensors put on it to look at monitoring 800 of the joints, um, wear, corrosion, etc. Uh, it measures traffic and there's 160,000 vehicles across it every day so it's got to track the movement and the effect that traffic has on the bridge itself. It's collecting that seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And that's a lot of data. So to define big data, we define it as data so vast, fast, now that means how fast it's being created and collected, or complex that it becomes impossible to store, process or analyse using our traditional data storage and analytic applications. Big data has four characteristics, the big V's of big data. Volume. Volume is the amount of data and it's big. That's why it's called big data. Velocity. This is one we quite often don't think of. This is the rate the data is generated. 
data can be generated at extremely high rates. So we look at the Sydney Harbour Bridge, we've got 3,200 sensors, each sampling at 100 samples per second. That creates a massive amount of data, but it creates it very, very rapidly. So how do we log that, store it and transport it? There's variety. Variety of, is a type of data that we're collecting. It can be of many different types. If we look at our agriculture application again, we're collecting numbers, pH level, salinity, temperature, humidity, but we could also add in video, looking for changes in uh, the foliage colour and growth for disease, looking for insects, so we're looking for pests and other things that are going to affect our crop. So we're capturing video data as well. We don't store those in the same way. We don't need to store them in the same way. This is also the veracity. How do we prevent inaccurate data from spoiling an entire data set, a uh, large part on its own? So how would we define how much data is actually big data? One person from IBM stated that it takes 200 to 600 terabytes to qualify as big data. And that's a lot of data. Uh, if we look at your average large hard drive nowadays, that's just two terabytes. So we're looking at 100 hard drives for a data set to be considered big data. There are a couple of different types of data that we deal with, structured and unstructured. Structured data is fairly traditional. This is data that's entered, maintained in fixed fields, something like an Excel spreadsheet. It's easily entered, it's very easily classified and queried, very easily analysed. We use rational databases, or as I said, spreadsheets, to handle this sort of data. But we now have, in our IoT environment, unstructured data. This is data that lacks organisation, for instance, samples from an IMU. It's raw data. It can also be photo contents. So we're looking at a photo, we go back to our agricultural one, we have a picture of a plant, it has a slight black discoloration on the leaf. How do we analyse that? How do we store it? Do we need to store the entire image or can we pull information from it? Other things like books, journals, blogs, normal text documents, they are unstructured. Yes, the document is structured, it's in words, but how do we index that? How do we search on it? That's where it becomes an unstructured data set. We also have the issues of data at rest and data in motion, and again, this is changing within the uh, Internet of Things. Data at rest is along the lines of our traditional database and spreadsheets. So it's data stored in a physical location, such as a hard drive or data centre, and we can analyse it in the normal way. It follows a flow of store, get the data, store it away. Analyse that data, then notify the user, and then act on that data. However, when we have things like sensors, the data is in motion, it's dynamic, things are moving, it's done in real time. We're measuring the movement of cars across a bridge in real time. We quite often can't process that data before it becomes obsolete. So if we want to know what the car is doing, for instance, look to see if it's speeding, is it breaking the speed limit? By the time we process the data to work out it has passed us, it is speeding, it's too late, it's already left the bridge and we can't do anything about it. So we need to analyse and take action uh, sooner rather than later. So the data flow in this case, when data is in motion, is we analyse, we act first, then we notify and then we store. So it's a different sort of flow uh, to the processing of this data and it has to be handled very differently. Okay, we have multiple types of data analysis that we can use. Our scalable technologies are enabling our data centres to manage uh, the top three aspects of big data, which is the, the volume, the velocity, how fast it's coming in, and the variety. So the different types, video, numerical, real-time, uh, text-based, etc. The data information, knowledge and wisdom, DIKW, model shows that the transition data undergoes until it gains enough value to inform wise decisions. Okay, this is the business intelligence. We see that uh, term thrown around quite a lot nowadays. So at the base we have data. That's the raw data. It doesn't have a great deal of meaning on its own. We need to process that into some form of information. So if we take the data, we've got these vibrations coming from the bridge. What do they mean? Well, it means it's a car. So that's information. We know it's a car. We know it's moving. We can turn that into knowledge. Knowledge is knowing that it's a car travelling on the bridge and it's travelling at, say, a certain speed. Wisdom we can apply then is making a decision based on that knowledge. So we know how fast a car is, is it actually travelling at a safe speed? The wisdom of knowing what to do with the data and make a decision from it. So why do we analyse big data? Multiple types of analytics provide organisations and people with the information that can drive innovation and improve efficiency while mitigating risk. We have descriptive analytics, this relies solely on historical data and regular reports. This is very traditional, what we've been doing in the past. 
is predictive analytics. So what we do is we look at the patterns that have been happening previously and we try to establish a future trend. We could use this in our agricultural scenario. So we look at the level of sunlight, the temperature, the humidity, and we can forecast what we think the conditions of the soil are going to be over the next few days or weeks. So we have predictive analytics. We also have prescriptive analytics. These recommend actions or decisions that are based on a complex set of targets, constraints and choices. We use this a lot in dealing with humans, so if we have a student body we can identify at-risk students by using prescriptive analytics. Okay, so let's have a look at the sources of data again. The IoT uses sensors to create data, the sensors in smartphones, cars, planes, street lamps, bins, anything. We can actually capture raw data from many, many things uh, for many different purposes. The list of things is growing consistently and the IoT is actually contributing quite dramatically to this growth in big data. So let's look at some of the preliminaries. Our concerns with the IoT is that data may come in large volume and different forms. Again, we look at the sensors, we've got lots of numerical values coming in from our agricultural sensors or our bridge sensors, and we also have video. We're capturing video of people on the uh, bridge, cars on the bridge, or condition of the leaves and foliage uh, within our agricultural application. IoT data requires more analytic tools for structured and unstructured data. We need to make observations on these variables and valuables. A variable is anything that varies from one instance to another and is something that can be measured, manipulated or controlled. The recording of values, patterns and occurrences as a set of variables is an observation and a set of values for a specific observation is called a data point. And we can see these in the table uh, laid out just for a particular type of dog, its colour, size, etc. So that's how we actually classify the data. We have categorical variables which include nominal, two or more categories or names that identify the object, and ordinal. Ordinal are two or more categories in which the order matter in the value. And numerical variables can include continuous. Uh, these can be quantitative along a continuum or range of values, such as the one we would get from our agricultural sensors measuring pH or salinity. We have ratio, and we have discrete, quantitative, with a specific value from a finite set of values. And again, explained further in this, uh, this chart. Right, we have a couple of different types of statistics we can gather from this. We have descriptive statistics. These describe or summarise the values and observations of a data set. We have inferential statistics. The process of collecting, analysing and interpreting data gathered from a sample to make generalisation or predictions about a population. And this particular one is probably of the greatest interest because we can start to make decisions based on past that may happen in the future. So what are the ethical concerns? Data protection varies from country to country. It's not really one set uh, set of standards, so uh, we have to be careful where we're collecting this and make sure we adhere to the uh, local laws and regulations. Confidentiality, integrity and availability, known as the CIA triad. And this is a guideline for data security in an organisation. Security is a very important area which we're not really covering a great deal in uh, this quick workshop, uh, but it's something that should be considered with any IoT or data gathering exercise. Four general cloud security controls are available. Deterrent, make it hard to get in, warn people, have penalties in place. Preventative, this could be your firewall, your rules-based setup to uh, stop people getting in. Detective, if somebody does break in, let you know that they've broken in. Uh, worst thing that can happen is actually someone breaks in and you don't know about it. And then corrective, once something has happened, there has been a breach or a leak of uh, data, then we need to take corrective action to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So in summary, data can be many things. It can be words in a book, it can be the contents of a spreadsheet, photos, streams of uh, measurements sent from a device like our examples of agriculture and the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Data growth can be linear or exponential. Um, exponential growth is what's happening at the moment and it's a dramatic increase. We have the four V's of big data. Volume, the amount of it, the very large amount of it. Velocity, the rate at which we generate it and the rate we need to store it and transport it over a network. The variety, the variety is either numerical, image, text and other sorts of uh, data that we have, wide variety of data and big data. And veracity, making sure that it is actually correct and not going to corrupt our data set. Structured data is entered in fixed fields in a traditional way, either a database, spreadsheet or some other record. Unstructured data doesn't have that fixed schema and that creates a great deal of issues which we're only just now starting to learn how to cope with. Data rest, again, is the traditional way we had things, static data and is stored in a physical location. Data in motion 
is where we analyse and extract values from the data before it is stored. This is what we do in our real-time systems, what we would do in the Sydney Harbour Bridge example, and to a certain extent in the agricultural example. Basically this is what we're dealing with when we talk about big data. But there's a great deal more to it. Unfortunately we don't have the time to look at any of the statistical methods in detail. It suffices to say big data is exactly that. It's extremely large, it's growing, it's not static as our traditional data is. We need to have ways to store and transport this data rapidly uh, and we need to be able to make use of it, which means we need to analyse it and make predictions based on that data. So now we'll head off and uh, do a bit of a lab looking at uh, some examples of big data.